Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to the Healthy Libraries Program's um, presentation on grieving during a pandemic. Uh, it's information for people of all ages. Um, uh, Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries Program, or HELP, is a partnership with the Public Libraries of Suffolk County and the Suffolk Cooperative Library System Outreach Services Department, and is supported in part by the American Heart Association of Long Island. The program is an interdisciplinary team of public health, nursing, social work, and library science students whose aim is to provide evidence-based health information, screening, and case management to a diverse community of patrons in the public library setting, refer patrons to promote access to appropriate health and social services programs locally that will address their health and social support needs, and allow students to experience an interprofessional team and demonstrate the core competencies based on the Interprofessional Education Collaborative. Uh, your student presenters today are, uh, well, actually, Winnie De Los Santos, who is a social work student at Stony Brook University. Uh, she collaborated uh, significantly to the um, presentation, but she's not able to be here today. So. Uh, we have Nicole Malley, who is a library and information science student at the University of Buffalo uh, with an interest in education and reference. Uh, Nia Obara, she's a dual public health and public policy student at Stony Brook University. She's interested in health policy, data science, and epidemiology. Uh, Christine Weber is a social work student at Stony Brook University. Uh, her interests are working with the senior population and those living with cognitive disabilities. And uh, my name is Mev Gallagher. I am a library and information studies student at Queens College, and I'm interested in research and reference, user services, and health literacy. Um, okay, uh, so here are our learning objectives. Um, we hope that by the end of this webinar, Participants will be able to identify the stages of grief, understand how the pandemic has affected traditional grieving processes, understand how children and adolescents process grief, and learn methods of helping them work through it, understand how different types of pandemic-related loss can also cause grief, learn types of holistic self-help work through the grieving, to work through the grieving process, and be able to find federal, state, and local resources for grief support for people of all ages. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm a library student at Buffalo. And um, so let's just dive in. Um, so these definitions are directly from Medline Plus and grief is defined as a reaction to a major loss of someone or something and is most often an unhappy and painful emotion and grief may be triggered by the death of a loved one. People can also experience grief if they have an illness for which there is no cure, um, a chronic condition that affects their quality of life. The uh, end of a significant relationship may also cause grieving. And everyone feels grief in their own way, but there are common stages to the process of mourning. And um, it starts with recognizing a loss and continues until a person eventually accepts that loss. So um, people's responses to grief will be different depending on the circumstances of the death. And for example, if the person who died had a chronic illness, the death may have been expected. The end of the person's suffering might even come as a relief. Uh, if the death was accidental or violent, coming to a stage of acceptance may take longer. So uh, let's just move on to the next slide. And these are the five stages of grief. They are denial and isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And not all of these are meant to be felt in perfect order. And sometimes these feelings can occur in a cycle, but be reminded that grief is a normal human emotion and there are resources that exist that can help you cope with grief. Um, Next slide, please. 
So how is COVID grief different? Many people are experiencing grief during the COVID-19 pandemic and grief is a normal response to loss during or after a disaster or other traumatic event. And grief can happen in response to loss of life as well as the drastic changes to our daily routines and way of life that usually bring us comfort and a feeling of stability. And um, common grief reactions include shock, disbelief or denial, anxiety, distress, anger, periods of sadness, loss of sleep and loss of appetite. And I got this information from the CDC website, just so everyone is aware. And um, just remember that every individual is going to experience grief differently. With COVID-19 restrictions, it's difficult to properly deal with and cope with grief. Funerals and wakes have had to be reimagined. And oftentimes family members cannot say a proper goodbye or find closure through the depth of their loved ones. Um, now that we have touched upon grief and how to define it, Nia will present to you some facts and stati statistics on COVID-19 and mental health. Hi, so according to Spasiak and uh, Vosniak in 2020, the pandemic has exasperated many social determinants of health, such as race, poverty, and mental health, mainly because of unemployment, loss of health care, or isolation. There has been a significant increase in anxiety, depression, and substance abuse caused by the day-to-day -day stressors, which may affect people in the long run, since it will take a while to get back into a sense of normality. Though there hasn't been a lot of research into looking how grief from a loved one influences this. So in other words, it's normal if you're struggling it's just a part of the grieving process. Next slide, please. Those especially at risk for poor mental health are those with pre-pandemic mental illnesses and essential workers. In a survey of 1,366 respondents, more people were likely to seek help during the quarantine than afterwards, especially healthcare workers. This is troublesome because the pandemic is sure to have long lasting effects, not only in healthcare workers, but everyday people. So it's important to get help and to know when you're in crisis. And next person will be Christine. So hi, my name is Christine and I'm a social work intern from Stony Brook University. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Today, we're going to be talking about how children and teens are faced with sudden losses and how their lives and um, routines have been disrupted by the pandemic. And this is partially due because some of their relatives are getting sick with and sometimes dying with the virus. Uh, schools have been closed and then they've been switched to all virtual or a hybrid model. Sports and extracurricular activities have been canceled and then They've been established and then canceled again and reestablished. So that's very confusing to the children. Uh, not only being able to see their friends as often or in the same capacity than they once were be able to. Stressors that were created uh, change within the child's family. For example, now they have to take care of a grandparent. And these feelings of loss and changes or fear can be very difficult to the children and can bring about uh, a grieving process. Next slide. Grief related to traumatic stress reactions may include the following. Intrusive reactions, such as upsetting thoughts, images, nightmares, or memories. There can be physical or psychological distress, such as headaches, stomach aches, trouble concentrating, and jumpiness. Avoidance reactions, such as withdrawal, acting as if not upset about the death or avoiding reminders of the person, the way the person died, places or things related to the person or events that led to the death, negative mood or beliefs related to the traumatic death, such as anger, guilt, shame, self-blame, loss of trust, or believing the world is now unsafe. Increased arousals such as irritability, anger, trouble sleeping, and decreased concentration. Next slide. 
parents and caregivers play a very important role in helping the children process their grief. You need to ask questions to determine if your child's emotional state is and to better understand their perception of the events. Their children um, give permission to the children to grieve by allowing time to talk or express their thoughts in, created, in a creative way. Um, also, um, give them the ability to tell you how you feel and to uh, validate their opinions because it really matters. Spend time with your child doing activities, things that they enjoy. Provide age and developmentally appropriate answers. Maintain routines as much as possible, which is very important. Uh, model coping strategies for your child because they emulate what you say and do. Um, help them acknowledge what we can and cannot control and help them to practice calming and coping strategies. Next slide. Adolescents express grief and trauma differently than children at times. So some of the signs to look for is sleep changes, such as sleeping more than usual or insomnia, eating a lot more or less, signs of self-harm, substance abuse, or acting out more than usual, complaints of body aches that aren't usually um, attached to physical problems, isolating more than normal for a teenager, and uh, not doing the things that they once found enjoyment in. So when parents and caregivers notice the above behavioral changes or uh, suicidal ideation, it's um, very important to call the healthcare provider or mental health specialist for help. Next slide. So instead of focusing on the things that you have no control over, instead focus on what you can control, and that is you. The figure to the right shows you in the middle. The things that you can control is the way that you act, what you say, what you do, and how you behave. The things that you have no control over is other people's behaviors, other people's reactions, the weather, or even this pandemic. So labeling feelings, research suggests to help regulate emotions is to identify them, which makes them easier to manage. When you name it, you tame it. Movement is important because exercise releases feel-good endorphins, which are brain chemicals that trigger positive feeling inside the brain. Gratitude can improve physiological health and reduces toxic emotions. And journaling is very uh, important. It improves happiness, reduces stress, helps them understand more clearly what they are feeling, which can induce behavioral change. And we will discuss this more in detail later. Next slide. And here are some suggested activities for all ages, actually. Movie or game night, puzzles, word searches, and scavenger hunts. Reading together is very important for younger children. New hobbies such as sewing or taking a virtual or cooking class. Um, mindfulness uh, and yoga is great. Listening to audiobooks. There are virtual field trips now, going to a local zoo, state park, or museum. Making Play-Doh or slime with the younger children is a big hit. Uh, starting an herb garden during the winter months and later on a uh, regular garden outside. Exercise challenges with family and friends. Staying connected with friends is very, very important. And creating a memory book of a loved one is nice as well. Next slide. I created a list of some suggested books to help children deal with loss, preschool to age eight, and uh, the categories fall under general grief, loss of a grandparent, loss of a friend, and loss of a parent. Next slide. Here are some more uh, suggested books for ages eight to 12. Again, the category would fall under general grief, loss of a grandparent, loss of a friend, loss of a parent, and loss of a sibling, in fact. Next slide. Ah, yes. Uh, that's me. Uh, I'm Mev. I'm a library science student, and I will be uh, reading for uh, Winnie de los Santos, um, a social work student. 
so uh, here are uh, some, uh, there are other types of grief um, than, than simply loss. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you may feel grief due to the loss of a job, healthcare or financial security, uh, the inability to connect in person with friends, family or religious organizations, uh, missing special events and milestones such as graduations, weddings or vacations, um, and experiencing drastic changes to daily routines and ways of life that bring comfort. Um, you may also feel a sense of guilt for grieving over losses that seem less important than loss of life. Um, but grief is a universal emotion. There's no right or wrong way to experience it. And all losses are significant. Um, so one way to deal with an overwhelming emotion is to find a healthy way to express yourself. Uh, this makes a journal a helpful tool in managing your mental health as Christine mentioned earlier. So um, to get into a little detail about it, uh, journaling can help you manage anxiety, reduce stress and cope with depression. Journaling helps control your symptoms and improve your mood by helping you prioritize problems fears and concerns, tracking any symptoms day to day so you can recognize triggers and learn to better control them, and providing an opportunity for positive self-talk and identifying negative thoughts and behaviors. Um, so here's some tips to get you started with journaling because um, it's not natural for everybody to, to feel like they wanna write, um, but uh, first, uh, try to write daily. Just set aside a few minutes every day to write. This will help you to write and journal regularly. Uh, make it easy. Keep a pen and paper handy at all times. Then when you want to write down your thoughts, you can. Or uh, you can keep a journal on your computer, especially if you're working from home, like just, you know, you open up another document when you have something to say. Uh, um, Write whatever feels right. Uh, your journal doesn't need to follow a structure. It's your own private place to write whatever you want. Just let the words flow freely. And uh, use your journal as you see fit. You don't have to share your journal with anyone. But if you do want to share some of your thoughts with trusted friends and loved ones, you can. Um, okay, so here are um, here are some more tips for um, for taking care of yourself and uh, taking care of your your loved ones, whoever lives with you. Uh, being outdoors, so being outdoors can improve your health and well being in the following five ways. First, uh, it lowers your blood pressure and reduces stress. Spending time walking among or simply looking at trees lowers blood pressure and reduces the stress-related hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. Just, just looking at trees. Um, I don't know, it's kind of amazing to me. Uh, it improves your mood. Researchers have found that nature simply makes us happy. Anxiety, depression, and anger are notably decreased after spending time outdoors. Um, I know that when the Brooklyn Botanical Garden was open, uh, I used to go a lot and I found it very calming. Um, and when it closed, it was a, it was a loss that I grieved. <laughs> so uh, being outdoors also improves focus. Studies show that adults and children who have difficulty focusing or controlling impulses are better able to concentrate after being in nature. Uh, the natural world allows our brains to take a break from all that mentally drains us and even reduces symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, also known as ADHD. Uh, being outside helps us heal quicker. Um, illness and surgery can be painful and frightening, which can increase stress and slow healing. However, researchers discovered that people who spend time outdoors during their recovery required fewer painkillers, had fewer complications, and experienced shorter hospital stays. Um, and uh, being outside supports graceful aging. According to a study in the Journal of Aging and Health, 
Adults over 70 who spent time outdoors experienced fewer sleep difficulties, complained less about aches and pains, and enjoyed improved mobility and ability to perform daily activities. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, what's our next tip? The importance of exercise. Uh, you need to avoid staying sedentary. Um, while most people choose to exercise for weight loss or bodybuilding, you can experience the mental health benefits of exercising almost immediately. Um, if you're feeling lonely, you can seek out an exercise partner or a virtual group, such as a Zoom exercise class. Um, some free exercise apps are uh, Yoga for Beginners, Simply Yoga, Daily Workouts Fitness Trainer, Seven Minute Workout, and Nike Training Club. Um, they're all in the App Store and Google Play. All right, so now we're gonna talk about mindfulness. Um, mindfulness helps us put some space between ourselves and our reactions, breaking down our conditioned responses. Um, here's how to tune into mindfulness throughout the day. Set aside some time. You don't need a meditation cushion or a bench or any sort of special equipment to access your mindfulness skills but you do need to set aside some time and space. Observe the moment as it is. The aim of mindfulness is not quieting the mind or attempting to achieve a state of eternal calm. The goal is simple. We're aiming to pay attention to the present moment without judgment, <laughs> which is easier said than done, you know. Um, just let your judgments roll by. When we notice judgments arise during our practice, we can make a mental note of them and let them pass. Return to observing the present moment as it is. Our minds often get carried away in thought. That's why mindfulness is the practice of returning again and again to the present moment. Be kind to your wandering mind. Don't judge yourself for whatever thoughts crop up. Just practice recognizing when your mind has wandered off and gently bring it back. And I mean, that's the practice. You can practice mindfulness really anytime and anywhere. Um, it's often said that it's very simple, but it's not necessarily easy. Uh, the work is to just keep doing it. Results will accrue. Um, another coping, uh, another coping strategy is meditation. Um, the benefits of meditation include gaining a new perspective on stressful situations, building skills to manage your stress, increasing self-awareness, focusing on the present, uh, reducing negative emotions, increasing imagination and creativity, uh, and increasing patience and tolerance. Um, some apps for guided meditation are uh, Insight Timer, Calm, and Smiling Mind. Again, they're also uh, they're available like on the App Store um, and Google Play, and those are their um, those are little icons if you want to look for them. Um, apps can be really helpful for uh, beginning a meditation practice. But uh, let's, let's walk you through what a meditation might look like. Um, so you need to sit comfortably. Find a spot that gives you a stable, solid, comfortable seat. Maybe not a round rock. Um, notice what your legs are doing. If on a cushion, cross your legs comfortably in front of you. If you're on a chair, rest the bottoms of your feet on the floor. Straighten your upper body, but don't stiffen. Your spine has natural curvature. Let it be there. Notice what your arms are doing. Situate your upper arms parallel to your upper body. Rest the palms of your hands on your legs wherever it feels the most natural. Soften your gaze. Drop your chin a little and let your gaze fall gently downward. It's not necessary to close your eyes. 
you can simply let what appears before your eyes be there without focusing on it. Uh, next, you want to feel your breath. Bring your attention to the physical sensation of breathing. The air moving through your nose or mouth, the rising and falling of your belly or your chest. Notice when your mind wanders from your breath. Inevitably, your attention will leave the breath and wander to other places. Don't worry, there's no need to block or eliminate thinking. When you notice your mind wandering, gently return your attention to the breath. And be kind about your wandering mind. You may find your mind wandering constantly. That's normal too. Instead of wrestling with your thoughts, practice observing them without reacting. Just sit and pay attention. As hard as it is to maintain, that's all there is. Come back to your breath over and over again without judgment or expectation. When you're ready, gently lift your gaze. If your eyes are closed, open them. Take a moment and notice any sounds in the environment. Notice how your body feels right now. Notice your thoughts and emotions. And now Christine is gonna walk us through a, a little more, some more resources and information. So after everything, uh, know when you need to ask for help. Some people are more susceptible than others to mental health problems in the pandemic, such as those with a family history of addiction, anxiety, or depression. Those with a personal history of domestic violence may be more at risk, as are people who have been exposed to COVID-19 or affected by their jobs or even their health insurance. If feelings of sadness or other emotions are too much to manage on your own, it is very important to reach out for help. So if you're struggling to cope, there are many ways to get the help. All you have to do is call your healthcare provider if stress gets in the way of your daily activities for several days in a row. Teletherapy is remote therapy that has become very popular since the pandemic. Some examples of teletherapy are teletherapy sessions that are group sessions over the telephone or group chats and video conferencing such as Zoom or FaceTime. And this is all for individuals, couples, and groups. During the times of extreme stress, people may have thoughts of suicide. Suicide is preventable and help is available. For more information regarding signs and risks, you can visit the www.cdc.gov injury. Next slide, please. And for general information about mental health, you can visit the National Alliance of Mental Illness at uh, the, the information is the info at NAMI.org or the phone number 1-800-950-6264. Or you can visit the National Institute of Mental Health at www.nimh.nih.gov or 1-866-615. 6464. Next slide. Here's a list of national helpline resources. Of course, if you are in immediate crisis, please call 911. Uh, otherwise, there are phone numbers here, um, the distress uh, helpline. There is a number for English and Spanish speaking. There's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, National Domestic Violence Hotlines, and suicide prevention lifelines to name a few. Next slide. More national and local helpline resources, the Elder Care Locator, the Suffolk County Crisis Response or DASH, the CPEP program at Stony Brook, and the Domestic Violence Sexual Assault 24-Hour Hotline. Next slide, please. and some more local helpline resources, such as substance abuse, uh, adult protective services, child protective services, 
and Suffolk County Department of Social Services Emergency Service Hotline. Next slide, please. I believe this is Nia. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So other resources, um, for instance, for um, Hispanic women, especially immigrants, Safe and Mujer is a resource for women who are experiencing um, isolation, domestic violence, or any other um, emergency or uh, need for help. Catholic Charities of Long Island is also another resource. They offer things such as food drives, um, therapy, and other resources. Adelante of Suffolk County incorporates similar to Sip of Mujer, but more broadly, rather than just women. Family Service League is a local um, Long Island therapy company, group, whatever, um, that is all over Long Island in Huntington, Central Islip, Bayshore, Riverhead, Mastic, any place you name it. And additionally, if you want, you can go to psychologytoday.com slash US slash therapist to find a specific therapist or psychiatrist in your area that suits your need. So for instance, if you rather, if you just want to keep up uh, medication, um, they can work with you with that. If you want a private practice therapist, you can find someone or if you want, you know, completely different setup, they will work with you or give you resources for that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes. So um, just to give you uh, some more information about help, uh, if you need to contact us, we're um, available on YouTube where this and all of our webinars are uploaded. Uh, Facebook, also we have our, our webinars there if you prefer to view them there, um, as well as updates um, on future programming. Um, the website, uh, is uh, publichealth.sunnybrookmedicine.edu slash healthy underscore libraries underscore program. Uh, you can find out more about us. Uh, you can email us at healthy uh, underscore libraries underscore program at sunnybrookmedicine.edu. And you can always give us a call at 631-216-8220.